Today we're going to speak about a topic that is dear to my heart, and it's entitled Developing Rhythmic Sensitivity. Now, if you'll follow your outline, I will do my best to also follow your outline. And the first part of your outline is for you to introduce yourselves to me by following some instructions and performing these three rhythmic patterns, which will be referred to as the noted played rhythms that you see on the board. Now, I'll admit to you, this is a setup, because I've done this many times and no one has particularly survived even the second rhythm, much less the third. But because I knew I had to videotape a session today, I didn't take a chance and I really weighted it against you by putting the third rhythm on the board so that it would uh, assure the necessity for the lecture. So realize that the scales have been weighted against you. Now, you're welcome to prove me wrong. And I, of course, the, the purpose of a good teacher is to really become superfluous. If good teaching has taken place totally, then the teacher is no longer needed. You've learned everything you need to know. So you'll play all three rhythms, rhythmic patterns, perfectly and then we'll call it quits we can go home however I've prepared a long lecture just in case that doesn't take place perfectly <laughs> let's find out here are the instructions what I would like for you to do is to count out loud in a methodical monotone chant like voice separating and individualizing your counts very emphatically but you'll have to use your own counting system because we don't have a standardized counting system assigned for ourselves yet and count the rhythmic pattern out loud that you see as number one <clears throat> and as you're counting it I want you to clap very solid the rhythmic pattern that you see in front of you so that you'll clap the four quarter notes, you'll clap the rhythm that you see contained in the second measure, and you'll clap the four quarter notes again. And then just to get some solidification to it, we want to go back and repeat it a couple of times. Now the idea, of course, is that you're not going to sound like a lot of little people. You're going to sound like one large, huge person. So here we go. I'll count two counts, because two counts are all that are necessary in order for a pulse to be established, and then emphatically, enthusiastically, remember you're on camera, you want to count and clap and perform the rhythms of this pattern and perform it just with absolute cohesion. If I set that up solid enough that we just can't make a mistake, right? Here we go. And I expect this one to be right, by the way. <laughs> Here we are. Three and four and five. Good. Now, please, on the next rhythm, it was excellent. On the next rhythm, increase the intensity of the volume of your counting. That's sublevel to the sound of the actual claps. I want to hear that counting system coming out loud. The same thing now applies to our second rhythm, just as solid and with as much cohesion as everyone did on that first rhythm. One big person, not a lot of little people. Here we go. Three, four. I won't comment. <laughs> now, but remember, you were set up. This has happened everywhere. Don't feel bad. It's not this institution. It's not this place. It's not this audience. It's that rhythm. It might be a room full of music teachers or professionals. For some reason, the cohesion of a group trying to read a rhythm like that, unless they're maybe under total professional circumstances or a performance or a band or an orchestra, this is what happens. It's a very interesting uh, result. However, it may even get a little worse here, although the principle of that rhythm and this rhythm and this rhythm, those rhythmic patterns you will find are exactly the same. We're going to solve those 100%. There, we should do what we said we were going to do. We're going to lock the doors, make sure the doors are locked, bar the doors, post guards. No one leaves this room until those rhythms, all of them, are played perfectly. That's part of the deal. All right, we've got that settled now. 
So we, I better say that before we go for this third pattern because I think I'll have people running for the door at the end of the third pattern here. Are you ready? Three and four, go. Now I said that was your introduction to me and if everything were played absolutely perfectly that there would be no need for my introduction to you. So welcome to my introduction. <laughs> <laughs> the title of my lecture is Developing Rhythmic Sensitivity, a study designed for all musicians. This presentation is divided into five different sections. The first section is introduction, which we're in motion of now. The second is the law of rhythm. The third section is understanding the elements of rhythm. The fourth section is learning rhythmic patterns. And the fifth section you have, as I said, is a handout called related concepts. Now, there are, for those of you that want to know about information overload, enjoy that, there are 32 categories that are subcategories to these four main topics, and there are multiple divided categories below that. So we've got a lot of information to cover that will bring us back to all of the things that are necessary, including the framework that underlies the concepts, the terms, the definitions, the developmental ideas to be able to perform. But I really will assure you from some fairly profound and long-term experience, this group of people, you as an audience and a class, will perform to a much higher level of proficiency than you did a moment ago, all of the rhythm big patterns that you see on the board. And you will do it with full understanding in the matter of the next hour, hour and a half. And I hope you'll appreciate the results of that. But let's lay some groundwork. This is B, defining rhythm. Now, this was also a bit of a setup because we're being videotaped. This was a, quote, volunteer effort on the part of a few of Dr. Gerber's students to define rhythm. So a few of those volunteered students that have defined rhythm, I need to see a show of hands, and we're going to have a quick reading, if you would, of your definition of rhythm. Now, you can't be wrong. You really can't, because there isn't a right or a wrong definition in our setting of the definition of rhythm. I might have a reaction to that as being, quote, more objective or more subjective or a combination of the two, but I'll certainly accept your definition. So where are my brave, volunteered, uh, I suppose, percussion majors or souls that have uh, written a definition of rhythm? Okay, I see them over here. Uh, I saw the first reluctant hand rise there. So uh, what is your name? Caleb Aaron. All right, Caleb, uh, would you read your definition of rhythm to us, please? The space between the notes. The space between the notes. Okay, um, that I would consider more on the objective definition of rhythm, and I'll, of course, try and qualify that a little later on. Thank you. Uh, and, and by the way, when I had requested that, I said, for whoever would write a definition of rhythm, uh, again, no reference materials, no books, nothing to look up, just the first thoughts that come to mind. That was what was important to me, all right? Someone else, please, uh, another volunteer, young lady, and what is your name? Olivia. Olivia. Rhythm is pulse that can be felt physically, heard, and seen, then notated as musical language. Good. All right. And that's a very objective definition, and you're using one of the terms that's my favorite, which is the word pulse, which I will deal with throughout the lecture. Thank you. Let's have one more. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, your name, please. Neil. Neil. Rhythm is the thing that causes flow. It creates the movement. Rhythm is not only applicable to music. But in everything, rhythm is the catalyst behind everything that moves. Good. And I'm glad that we did do yours because I think yours represents more of the subjective influence of rhythm as opposed to the more objective short definition and the more mathematically precise definition and then the more subjective universal definition of it. And I'll try and qualify that as I move forward. So I thank you for that. So we've made a few definitions of rhythm. You certainly individually, regardless of what I would say during this lecture, should sit down 
without any references, and you should define rhythm. You should define it both objectively for yourself, and you should define it both subjectively, uh, either, both, meaning you should define it objectively and subjectively. And if you will do that as a result of the discussion and, and the lecture today, I think you'll have a much better insight as to what wording you might put to that. So there are two concepts that are utilized in order for rhythm to be produced. The first one that I've chosen is sound. And of the very shortest possible definition, and there'll be longer ones forthcoming, that I can give to sound, I would just simply say that sound is that which can be heard resulting from a stimulation of our auditory nerves by vibrations carried in the air by sound waves. And then there's time. That time is that period between two events or a precise instant, a minute, a second, the appointed moment for an event to occur. One of my favorite concepts of time is that it's 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds in a year. Now, those 46 seconds, those seconds, that's what we're concerned about as musicians. Let's think of the example as a, a runner or two runners in a race. If those two runners are in a race and one runner comes in after the other and they're just one second apart, you say, that was really close. But if you think about it, and you're a musician, and two musicians are making an entrance on a piece of music, and one musician comes in, and he's just one second after the other, he's fired. <laughs> so, you see, there can't be those kind of discrepancies in music as there might be in other areas. And not only that, if you, maybe even more precisely, if you take three eighth notes and you have those occur under a triplet sign, and you take four sixteenth notes and you have it occur at the same time, and you assign them at the value of a quarter note equaling 60, those notes are one twelfth of a second apart. And we can tell whether or not those rhythms are being played properly or not. Because because perceptually we are tuned in to that kind of a sound. And if the quarter note equal 120, then those notes are 1 24th of a second apart. And we're tuned in to that just as well. So you see, perceptively, we are dealing with microseconds when we're talking about time and music. Now, sound. The science of sound is acoustics. When I take my hands and I clap them together like this, the sound wave that's produced travels away from my hands at 768 miles per hour, or 1,127 feet per second, given a constant room temperature, of course, of about 68 degrees Fahrenheit that we're in. Now, when that sound wave hits anything, three things happen. One, the sound wave is reflected. That means it's thrown back. The other is that the sound wave is diffused. That means it's scattered. And the other, the sound wave is absorbed. It's absorbed or engulfed by your clothing, all in all of which reduce and diminish and decay the sound wave's intensity until it disappears. So the sound as it exists, which is such an important entity that has to occur before rhythm can take place, has qualities that are the same as the same qualities we find in producing a rhythmic pattern. And some of those qualities are attributes. What are the attributes of sound that are vital to producing rhythmic patterns? One of those is duration. Duration is length. Sound has length. Rhythmic patterns have length. Another is location or position. A rhythmic pattern has a particular location or a position in a measure. A note has a location or a position in a measure. So location. Another is pace or the rate of vibration or the occurrence of silence. Silence is just as important as the sound. Or dynamics, the volume level, the loud and the soft or the accents. Now you know we're continuously surrounded by sounds. In fact, every vibration vibration that happens in the air affects what's happening around us. For instance, when uh, we hear the sound of a mosquito, we're very annoyed by that sound, and we don't think much about it as being a rhythm. But if we would take those flapping wings and we would slow them down enough that we could identify them by their speed as being an actual rhythm, they are. We could identify them as a rhythm. If we would take the incoming surf, we could identify it as a rhythm if we could speed it enough, up enough to be measured. So the important thing to realize about sound as it relates to attributes that are equal to rhythm is that the qualities and the attributes are really the same. Duration, position, pace, 
dynamics. Now take a simple example like this incredible quarter note, I like to call it. The incredible quarter note has at least these two main qualities that we're interested in, and one is that it has a position, the other is that it has a duration. That means that if you play the quarter note wrong, you're going to either play it at the wrong time or you're going to play it at the wrong link length. So if a quarter note occurs on the first count of a measure, that's its position. If the quarter note is a one count note in 4-4 time, it is a one count note. That is its duration. So the quarter note occurring on the first count of a measure has two attributes. It has a position, that's the point at which it occurs. It has a duration, that's its length. I don't care how complicated the rhythmic pattern might be, if you make a mistake on it, you're still making a mistake the same way. You're making a mistake by playing the note the wrong length or at the wrong time. Now you add some human elements to that, such as not watching, not thinking, not listening, and I call that five strikes and you're really out because you're not accomplishing what is necessary to properly perform a rhythmic pattern. Time. Webster defines time as every moment that there ever has been or ever will be. It's one of those infinite wonders that taxes the imagination like space that knows no limits. Time is endless in either direction and relentlessly moves in one. Time is precious. In 1967, the world timekeepers met in France and agreed to establish the basic unit of time, which was the second upon which we base our rhythm. And they established that unit of time as being 9,192,631,000 770 vibrations of a cesium-133 atom. Now that is accurate timekeeping, and that is what we base our second on, and we base our rhythmic patterns upon the second. So objective time, then, is often thought of as clock time, train, and navigation schedules, telecommunication, all depend upon accurate time standards. Those standards, of course, are based upon the revolution of the Earth around the sun and the Earth's rotation upon its own axis. So objective time is founded upon the objective universe. That's why I made the comment about that definition being more objective. It was more mathematical. It was based on our objective universe. From old grandfather clocks to modern day wristwatches, Watches. The purpose of timekeeping devices is to divide the day up into hours and minutes and seconds, and for us, parts of a second. Now, G on your outline, what is subjective time? Subjective is something that results from the feelings of the subject of the person. It might be the musician or the artist or the writer or the speaker. And it's something that results more from the feelings rather than the attributes of the object itself. So time relating to our personal experiences is time that feels to be passing in a certain way. For instance, when we are in the middle of a traffic jam, time seems to be passing very slowly. But we're in the midst of a very exciting, enjoyable activity, which I hope this is, time seems to be passing very quickly. So our interpretation of time is subjective time. The literal interpretation of time based on the universe's rotation and clock time is objective time. So then we have to look at how rhythm exists in relation to First, objective time. Rhythm, as it exists in relation to objective time, would be the objective rhythms that are the noted, played, written down rhythms. Rhythm in relation to subjective time is the proportion of rhythm that first occurs in the mind of a conductor, of, of a composer, then after it occurs in the mind of a composer, it is perceived or interpreted in the mind of a conductor and a performer. Now, since subjective rhythms are interpreted in the mind of a conductor or the musicians, 
They can be very inaccurate. They can be filled with the variables that we talked about of duration and position and pace and dynamics. And, and think about what really happens in that subjective experience too. It's like a triangulation. You have a conductor up in front with a whole lifetime of experience as to how they think the rhythmic pattern should go. You have a player over here and a player over here. They're having to listen to each other and coordinate from their life experiences, listening to each other internalizing how they feel the rhythm should be according to their life experiences and perfectly coordinating with the conductor up there. So it's a very complicated subjective process to be able to get rhythmic patterns that are objective subjectively interpreted accurately. Therefore, there's a cycle that's created and you need to be aware of it and it'll make you a little bit more aware of the process. When rhythm is considered then in relation to objective and subjective time, a cycle is created. And here it is. Rhythms are subjectively conceived in the mind of a composer. Those rhythms then become objective when they are noted as rhythmic patterns. The noted rhythmic patterns then become subjective again when they are interpreted in the mind of the conductor, the performer, or the teacher. So we had a few bumps along the way here. We had, a, as I call it, a little rhythmatism happening. And what's going to happen over the course of the lecture is we're going to study what I also call a little rhythmology. And the rhythmology, as we solve the problems, will make you full classified rhythmettes as we reach the end of this lecture. And this is the end of part one, the introduction. The Law of Rhythm. We live in an ocean of motion. Everything in our universe is moving in rhythm with everything else. Whether swinging in and out, moving forward and backward, or having a low and high tide, nothing is still. Every action has a reaction. When something advances, something must retreat. When one thing rises, another must sink. All of these are but individual expressions of one of the great natural laws of our universe, the law of rhythm. This law can be observed in part on the physical level by the change of seasons, night and day, or rain and sunshine. It may be observed in the mental, emotional realms through the rhythmic swings of negative and positive expressions of thought. In music, the law of rhythm is the nucleus of the creative process. Composers use musical elements to create dissonance and consonance, tension and release, symmetry and imbalance. Conductors and performers recreate or interpret the composer's intentions. Interpretation is a subjective process, but at its foundation must be an objective or literal understanding of the noted music symbols. Even though tempo and nuance may vary with each performance, pitches and rhythm remain constant and rhythm is still the cornerstone. Through rhythm, body movements become dance, words become poetry, and sounds become music. The law of rhythm, sounds become music, the noted rhythmic patterns. But you see, rhythm is not just as it's often conceived and thought of to be, which is the noted rhythmic patterns, the mathematical relationships. It's the universal rhythm. It's the heartbeat. It's the one, two, in, out, up, down, over, under. It's everything that affects every part of your life. And as you start to tune into it, your mathematical rhythm will become much better as your universal conception and, and awareness of the universal rhythm amplifies. So become aware of the universal rhythm and you'll become better mathematically as a performing musician. What then is the formal definition of rhythm, the quote, mathematical nece necessary definition? Uh, my definition then is rhythm in music is the organization 
of duration in time. The organization of duration in time. Now, if you think about that, and I've stated it before, a duration is a length. The organization is to properly position something. So if you're organizing something in a space of time, you are properly placing a length of sound into a measure of time. It consists of three elements, meter, pace, and accent. And that actually ends part two. Part three, understanding the elements of rhythm. What I'd like for you to do is look very carefully at the chart that you have in front of you. The chart, I've realized even with more study, is not totally conclusive, but it's very helpful. And there are two arms to the chart that I want you to look at, especially at the moment, and those are the ones that occur under meter. As you look under meter, you'll see rhythmic structures going down as you face it on the left side. We'll get to those later. And you'll see unit, rhythmic patterns and pulse going down there on the right. Now, rhythmic patterns, even though it's just a term to you now, are the noted played rhythms. I want you to remember that only for the moment. And pulse, because I'll have to refer to it in the lecture before I actually get to it in the formal lecture material, are the equally spaced distances in measured time. All you need to remember about the pulse at the moment, if a meter signature could truly be considered as a fraction then the pulse is the denominator of the meter signature. So that will be your reference point to it. So rhythm in music is the organization of duration in time. That should mean more than it did when I first said the sentence at the first time. It is comprised of three elements, meter, pace, and accent. Now, first, meter, a definition of meter. Meter is a grouping of pulses, so you know that is the denominator of the meter signature, in one or more measures of time. A meter signature, which we're very concerned with, is a visual symbol through which musical sounds in time are organized and noted. Now, the musical sounds in time that we're concerned with are the rhythmic patterns. This is how we're going to organize and note those. Now, we're going to do a law of conducting in a moment, and I hope you'll find it very, very interesting. This is something quite unique and very different than anything you'll ever experience in any other situation, and it is based based specifically on these meter signatures. This evolved over a 15-year period teaching the course developing rhythmic sensitivity. We're going to take the meter signatures and we're going to define them, and it may be new terminology and terminology that you would have to accept only for the moment, only for the moment, as simple, compound, and complex. Now, I'll attach a definition to those in a moment. For this moment, though, I will simply say that the terms simple, compound, and complex refer to the manner and the rate of pulse occurrence and how it is divided and conducted. So, let's talk about the conducting part for a moment and hopefully give you this very interesting insight. Now, this will be Bell's Law of Conducting. We've had Bell's Law of Rhythm. This will be the Law of Conducting here. Um, first, I'll have to just say this. I, I watched professional conductors for more than 35 years, and I'll at least draw this conclusion and feel that I have a right to. If you watch a human being with a baton in their hand, and they are a conductor, the variations that you will find in a way a person conducts are as varied as the personalities of the conductors themselves. There is no doubt about that. Now, it is also a conclusion that if the conducting patterns that you're having to watch are not comfortable or logical or practical to the eye of the performer, then they are a waste of the performer performer's valuable time. So I'll get off of my soapbox now as a performer and I'll get back on as the lecturer, but I want you to re remember that because I think it's very important if you become a conductor, whatever you do, communicate clearly. If you hold a baton in your hand, which is part of your rhythmic training, you want to make sure that you use your wrist 
that you cup your fingers in, that you point your baton towards your performer, that you have no dangling digits to detract, you know, that you use good technique and you have to practice it. So let's make conductors out of everyone now and let's do it in a little different way than you've ever experienced. First of all, we're going to redefine conducting for a moment. We're going to do it in terms of its relation to these three meter signatures, simple, compound, and complex, and then make an, uh, an application of it. I would like for everyone to conduct with me, and remember, you're mirror imaging me, so if I say right, left, it's going to be opposite for you as you're looking at me. We're going to start with a conducting pattern of four, and I'd like to use that as the base pattern. This won't take long to do because we're going to cover all of conducting in the next four or five minutes. So what we will do is have you please put your hands in a conducting position. If you have a pencil in your hand, that would be great. Otherwise, something that you can use uh, would be, or if not. Now, I'd like you to conduct a four pattern, and this will be, say, four, four, four time. I'll give you an upbeat, and then just copy my pattern. So we're doing this. Four, one, two, three, four. Down, left, right, and up. One, two, three, four, cut off. Now, we want to go from four, four time to five something time. So we're going to add one leg to it on this side. We're going to go down, left, left, right, and up. So here we go. Ready? Go. One, two, three, four, five. Now this would be three plus two. All right? Now let's add the leg on the other side. So we're going to go one, two, three, four, five. Everybody do it that way, please. Ready? Go. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four. Now we've taken care of every pattern that would have a numerator of a four. Four, four, four time, four, eight time, four, sixteen time, occurring at a moderate tempo, and everything that might be a five pattern. Let's go to a six pattern. We're only going up to seven to make the point here. But a six pattern, we're going down, left, left, right, right, and up. So that would be one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? If you'll copy that, please. Ready? Go. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Off. And then we'll take our seven pattern. We want to add one more leg to the six, so we're going to make it four and then a three on this side. So it would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Off. You ready? Here we go. Ready? Go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five. And then we're going to reverse it, so we'll put the four pattern over here. So this will be three on this side, four on that side, and that'll be the end of the conducting, get you started with the patterns, but there's a reason for that. Here we go. Ready? Go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Now we did a four pattern, so if we're going to come back to a three pattern, we're just going to knock off one of the arms. Instead of going one, two, three, four, we're just going to take this side of it. We'll go one, two, three, one. Here we go. Ready? Go. One, two, three, one. And then we'll knock off another arm, and we're going to take two. We're going to go one, two, one. So if everybody will do that, ready? Go. One, two, one. Now, that'll give you all the conducting patterns that you need up through seven as far as a base pattern. You can use a million other interpretations, but those will be clear patterns. Now, some of the other things you obviously need to practice are doing cutoffs, being able to conduct smoothly while you do a crescendo and a decrescendo, louder and softer, and not have it be all bumpy with the other hand. And then, of course, you have to always remember to say, percussion, you're late. Percussion, you're behind. Percussion, you're too loud. And <laughs> things like that. Oh, sorry, <laughs> it slipped, slipped out of my lecture mode there. All right, now, meter signatures. Write this down. You'll have to have this written down for future reference. It's not in your notes, but it's very important. <clears throat> The meter signatures are defined, again, as simple, compound, and complex. All right? I'm going to assign a parameter of 15, arbitrarily, to all these meter signatures. And then, for the simple meter signatures, I'm going to give them a numerator of the following numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, or 8. One, two, three, four, or eight. For the compound meter signatures, I'm going to give them a numerator of six, nine, twelve, or fifteen. Six, nine, twelve, or fifteen. For the complex meter signatures, a numerator of five, 
7, 10, 11, 13, or 14. And just hope you don't have to conduct anything past 7. Now, a simple meter signature is a meter signature that contains the same number of pulses between the primary and the secondary accents. Now, what does that mean? There's an inferred primary accent in a simple meter signature, which I'll call 2-4 time or 4-4 time on the first count of the measure. There's an implied secondary accent that occurs on the third count of the measure. Now, they aren't strong actual accents. They're implied accents. One, two, call them the strong beats, you know, the weak beats being the afterbeats, the syncopated beat feel. All right, so that means that the same number of pulses occur between the implied primary and secondary accents. Every meter signature, simple, compound, or complex, can occur at three different tempos, slow, medium, or fast. That means we have nine conducting rules, nine possibilities of conducting. We can conduct a simple meter signature, slow, medium, or fast. So here's what you do. If you have a simple meter signature and you're going to conduct it slow, and this has totally everything to do with the performance of your rhythmic patterns, by the way, because if you can't recognize what's coming from the podium, besides being able to produce it, you're going to be just as confused as you would be if you could produce it but can't recognize it coming at you as far as the conducting pattern in relation to the rhythmic pattern pattern. Conducting is 50% of being able to understand performance of your rhythm, <clears throat> or at least a high percentage. When a simple rhythmic, um, when a simple meter signature occurs at a slow pace, two conducting strokes will occur for each pulse. That's the denominator of the meter signature, all right? That means that you're dividing the pulse. Now, you're not subdividing it. It's a common misstatement that conductors often make, and they make it casually, and it's kind of a common term. I'll subdivide, you know. If they were actually subdividing, they're going two levels down, so they'd be conducting 16th notes if you were in 4-4 time. You're just dividing the pulse, so you're going one level down. So if I were in 4-4 time, and I would take a simple meter signature, and I would divide it, then I would conduct one and two and three and four and. If that simple meter signature occurs at a moderate pace, I simply conduct the pulse. One, two, three, four. So that's rule two. I conduct the pulse of a simple meter signature. If that simple meter signature occurs at a fast pace, one conducting stroke occurs for every two or, you write down the word or, or three pulses, because it's going to be different than it will be for complex meter signatures. One conducting stroke occurs for every two or three pulses. And the reason, if you think about it, is that simple meter signatures contain the same number of, of distance, the same amount of distance between the primary and the secondary accent. So you're not going to find a 5-4 measure in a simple meter signature. That's going to be a complex meter signature, and it's going to have a different distance between a primary and a secondary accent, so that when you divide it at a fast speed, you're going to have within a single measure a 2 plus 3. But when you do a simple meter signature, the two or the three are going to be in different measures. Therefore, when you're going at a fast tempo and you have a 2-4 measure and a 3-4 measure, it is an or because one conducting stroke occurs for each measure, one, two, one, two, three. That's two different measures. One, two, four measure followed by one, three, four measure. I'm going to apply this to an example where you'll see it. And I know this is a little tricky, but this is absolutely true. This is the way that rule will work, and it's proven itself over and over again. So you have a simple meter signature occurring at three different tempos, slow, medium, and fast. You take at the slow tempo, and you divide the pulses into two parts. At a moderate tempo, you conduct the pulses, and at a fast tempo, one conducting stroke occurs for every two or three pulses. Compound meter signatures. Second, they contain the same number of pulses between the implied primary and the secondary accents. So we'll take a simple example, 6-8 time, all right? What happens at the slow tempo for a compound meter signature? You conduct the pulses. One, two, three, four, five, six. What happens at a moderate pace and at a fast pace? And there's a little threshold point here, but generally one conducting stroke occurs for every three pulses. One, two, three, four, five, six. You don't go one, two, three, four, five, six. There's a transition point where one conducting stroke occurs for every three pulses. So for compound
pound meter signatures, you have those same three rules in essence. You can say at a moderate tempo, one conducting stroke occurs for every three pulses. At a fast tempo, one conducting stroke occurs for every three pulses. Now, complex meter signatures do not contain the same number of pulses between the implied primary and the secondary accents. All right, what's an example then of a complex meter signature? Five, four time, for instance. Now, if you think about it, that's a two plus three or a three plus two. It doesn't have the same distance between the primary and the implied secondary accent. So, if it's going at a slow pace, you will divide the pulses just as you would on a simple meter signature. One, and two, and three, and four, and five, and. So now you know the answer to a complex at a slow. At a moderate pace, you will conduct the pulses just like you do for a simple meter signature. One, two, three, four, five. But at a fast pace, complex meter signatures have one conducting stroke occur for every two and three pulses because it has to occur within a measure. So it's one, two, three, four, five, or one, two, three, four, five, because you're within the same measure. Now, that's just so many facts laid at you that it makes no sense until you see it applied practically to an example in music, and that's what I intend to do now so that it does make sense and it hopefully takes on value. So would you look please at your example called the changing rhythmic structure, which is your next example, and I'll flip over to it and I'll take you through that, applying those rules, and then I hope you will see much more why this is so important and applicable to what we're accomplishing here. The changing rhythmic structure, I'll give a quick definition on just so it would be clear. It's a rhythmic structure in which the same number of pulses do not occur in every measure and the distance between the prim primary and the secondary accents are not the same. It's sort of a double negative. All right, now if you look at this little example, you'll see a 2-8 measure followed by a 316 measure, followed by a 38, a 68, a 78, a 316, a 38, a 516, a 68, 316, 516 and a 38 measure. Let's think about the rules. The first measure is a 28 measure. That is a simple meter signature and I'm going to start it at a moderate tempo. What do I have to do? Apply the second rule to that. I'll have to conduct the pulse. So I conduct the pulse. One, two. That forces the next measure, which is a 316 measure, to be a simple meter signature occurring at a fast tempo. Therefore, one conducting pulse will occur for every two or three pulses. So in this case, it's three pulses because it's a single measure. So I make one conducting stroke for every three pulses. First measure, one, two, one, two, three. Next measure is a simple meter signature, three, eight time, occurring at a slower, moderate tempo. I'll conduct the pulse. One, two, three. The next measure is a compound meter signature, and the, it's a moderate tempo, so I'll conduct the pulses. One, two, three, four, five, six. Same thing for the seven. That's why I took you up to seven in the conducting patterns. One, two, three, four. That was the four pattern. And then here's your 316. One, two, three. And now I've pretty much laid out those patterns for you. Look at measure eight and you will see a complex meter signature occurring at a fast tempo. The division according to the rhythmic pattern is two plus three. Therefore, one conducting stroke occurs for every two and three pulses within the same measure. One, two, three, four, five. That's what makes it different than the simple meter signatures. Now that only took about 20 years to figure out and I've given it to you in about 10 confusing minutes. I hope you'll go back and review it and see it applied to these exercises and, and how valuable it will be. Here it is in application. The first of this exercise conducted and counted and demonstrated <clears throat> using those nine rules for conducting plus the patterns. One, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three. Okay, and then that would become 
One, two, one, two, three, one, and two, and three, and one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, one, two, and three, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, one, point of articulation of the rhythmic pattern. And when that starts to become natural, it starts to become something that's more the sound, which is what rhythm is really all about. Dum, dum, dee, dum, dum. Dum dee dum 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 dee dum dum ta 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 dee da 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 dum dee dum 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 dee dum. Just that natural sound. You see it. The application of the pattern to the sound of the rhythm. Very important. This brings us to. E, meter signatures as related to pulses, rhythmic patterns, and units. If there were a most important applicable section to this entire lecture that you should walk away with, it would be this. This is the center of everything. This is the essence of what the entire course was about. This is the essence of what your performing is about. That which you see and play against that which is just as important that is there that you feel and you count but you don't see. So let's, that's by the way the answer to part of this. First of all I said that meter signatures are visual symbols through which musical sounds in time can be organized and noted. I said that pulses which is the denominator of the meter signature, are the equally spaced distances in measured time. Now, if the pulses are the equally spaced distances in measured time, that means that in this measure, there are four implied pulses going on throughout each of these measures. You don't see them, they're the conducting beat. It's the count off. It's the metronome click. It's the hi-hat. It's whatever might be the equally spaced distances or the denominator of the meter signature. But it's just as important as though it were the actual noted rhythmic pattern, because it's always there. When you're performing a piece of music, if you're not thinking as much about the implied pulse underneath as you are about the noted rhythmic pattern, you're only thinking at this moment about one third, at least, of what is available to be able to perform the rhythmic pattern properly. So underneath that noted rhythmic pattern is one, two, three, four, one, two, etc. Now, the second thing that is there is called the unit count. The unit count is the smallest practical division or subdivision of the noted rhythmic pattern or the pulse. The smallest practical division or subdivision of the noted rhythmic pattern or the pulse. What does that mean? That which you count. We're going to learn that that is a division up to nine parts, and you don't really need it past nine. So if you can count something that would let you know how and where to perform those notes in a unified way, you might have agreed on that as a group. And we have to determine what that unit count would be. Now, we're going to get to that relationship a little bit later on in the lecture. But right now, I'll just give you the answer to it because I want to make the point of how important it is. The unit count for these two counts of this measure is simply eighth note triplets. Now, you're used to playing eighth note triplets into two groups of three. But what happens when you see what is called a counter rhythm or a polyrhythm or this different kind of rhythm that's listed here? It's just changing the mathematical relationship of the unit count. It doesn't change the intrinsic value of the rhythmic pattern itself. So it's no longer two groups of three eighth notes under a triplet sign. It's just three groups of two eighth notes under a triplet sign. You're just shifting the accent. So what's really happening in terms of the unit count is one, two, three, four, one D and a two O lit, three O lit, four and one becomes one, two, three, 
4, 1D and uh, 2 OLED, 3 OLED, 4 and 1, 2. If you pictured eighth note triplets up here, and you pictured those eighth note triplets as two groups of three eighth note triplets, now repicture them, rebarred as three groups of two eighth note triplets, so that you're changing the accent one O oh, let two O oh, let. Still the same eighth note number of triplets, you're just changing the point of articulation. So it becomes unit count sixteenth notes, two counts of eighth note triplets, a unit count of eighth notes. One D and a two O oh, let three O oh, let four and. Now, if you will do that with me, we will unify. We will unify. You don't get out of the room if we don't. You will unify on those rhythms and the performance of this rhythmic pattern. Let me demonstrate it. One, two, unit counts, four. One D and a two, O oh, let, three, O oh, let, four, and one. Now, pulse, two, three, unit count, one, two, three, four, sixteenths, one D and uh, eighth note triplets, two O oh, let, three O oh, let, four, and re-accented, two O oh, let, three O oh, let, four, and two O oh, let, three O oh, let, four, and. All right, count it with me first, please. Ready? Out loud, chant-like, monotone, individualized, do the work with me. Three, count. One, two, three, four. One D and a two, oh let, three, oh let, four, and one, two, again, three, four, go. One, two, heart, three, four. Thank you. One D and a two, oh let, three, oh let, four, and one. Get ready to clap. Two. Three. Now clap. Four. Go. <laughs> Keep going. Two. Three. Again. And one D and two and a three and four and one D and a two. Oh, let three. Oh, let four and one more solid. Two. Three. One more time. Four. Go. One. Two. Now nail it. And. And. Two. Three. Four. That's much more, and thank you for it, one large person rather than the other. So you're thinking mathematically more the same. Now, there are a lot of things that could be said about what you would do to make that less of a, uh, a metronomic kind of performance and make it more natural musically. But at this point, we had to establish the math in order to unify the sound, and that's what we did, and that's what worked. F, rhythmic patterns. Now this is in this room. This is not the kind of thing you take out of this room. This is where you really get the double stare and the insulting look if you say, oh, I see you're, uh, you're performing a simple regular rhythmic pattern, or I see you're playing a complex regular uh, pattern there, and that's about as far as that conversation will go. However, for our purposes now, we're going to classify and define a single measure of rhythmic pattern, and you'll just just need to follow this carefully, it only takes a second, and then you'll have, again, terminology for deciding how a single measure of rhythm can be classified in terms of verbalizing the image, which is part of this whole lecture idea. <clears throat> all right? We have four things that can happen. First of all, a noted rhythmic pattern can be simple. If it's simple, and we have one measure of 4-4 four, four time, which will be our example, that means that no pulse changes at all from pulse to pulse. That means that of the four counts, whatever rhythmic pattern or little unit of count you write over the first count is going to be exactly the same over the second count, over the third count, and over the fourth count. All four counts are exactly the same, okay? Simple. If it is complex, that means that anyone or any number of the counts change. So if the first count is 4 sixteenths and the second count is 
anything other than four sixteenths, then your rhythmic pattern is classified as complex rather than simple. Got it? Two things that can happen so far. All right? Now, two other things can happen to the rhythmic pattern. We can define it as being regular. That's where it is a natural division or subdivision of the denominator of the meter signature, which is a progressive doubling or halving. Okay? You normally take a meter signature and you cut it in half. You divide a quarter note into two eighths or four sixteenths, or if you're in, you know, it goes into normal progressive, but if you take a meter signature, like, to, uh, four four time and you put an eighth note triplet in it you're superimposing that three against two on top of it so that's irregular if you put a five or a seven in there they're always irregular so it doesn't belong in that meter signature as a natural division or subdivision of the denominator of the meter signature therefore it's irregular so if it's irregular it's not a natural division whereas in four four time if you wrote the four sixteenth notes that would be regular but if you wrote an eighth note triplet, that would be irregular. So look at example E. In example E, you see a simple regular measure. That means that every count is exactly the same as every other count, and every division or subdivision is exactly what you would expect to be the normal progressive doubling or halving of the denominator of the meter signature. But if you look at the second example, even though every count's the same, that keeps it simple, but it's irregular because that's not a natural division of the denominator there. You look at the third one, it's complex because those are natural divisions, progressive divisions, but it changes. And then you look at the fourth one, it is both complex and irregular. Okay, we'll push ahead, we're getting through all of this. The next is H. Four types of larger rhythmic structures. I bring you back to your chart on this marathon learning session. On your chart, under rhythmic structures, there are four kinds. A metrical, a measured, a changing, and a free. And if you notice, this will finish up that whole big side of the chart, which is by far the hardest thing we have to do here in this ex explanatory information. All right, a metrical rhythmic structure, and you need to take notes on this because it's not all there, is comprised of simple, or compound meter signatures. It's comprised of simple or compound meter signatures. Now, that's when the same number of pulses occur between the primary, uh, implied primary and secondary accents just like it did on the meter signature. It's the same thing for the metrical rhythmic structure. And you remember that that's what happened on the meter signature. So a metrical rhythmic structure is comprised of simple and compound meter signatures. Whereas the next one, a measured rhythmic structure, is comprised of complex meter signatures. So if it's comprised of complex meter signatures, you know from our definition before that the distance between the implied primary and secondary accents are not the same, but the entire composition is made up of, say, a complex meter signature. Therefore, the same number of pulses do occur throughout every measure of the entire composition. All right, then we can have a changing rhythmic structure. A changing rhythmic structure consists of all three kinds of meter signatures, as you would expect, simple, compound, and complex. But of course, what would happen here is the distance between the primary and the secondary accents are not the same, and the measures themselves do not contain the same number of pulses, because you've got this mixture of all these different kind of meter signatures. And then finally, there is the free rhythmic structure, and that's the potpourri, it catches everything else. That's when the measures of a composition are allowed to fluctuate freely in time, ametric notation, uh, pieces that are just note heads without any kind of, uh, of stems. Uh, any other kind of compositional technique would fall under that category, where the rhythmic patterns are allowed to fluctuate freely in, pa in pace in, in relation to the steady rhythmic pulse structure. There are a couple of concepts that are associated with a free rhythmic structure that you might be more or less familiar with. One is I, called metric modulation. You should investigate that if you're not totally familiar with it. It's one means of, in, of, of avoiding this traditional two-part, four-part division of the pulse. It's a compositional technique for gradually moving from one meter to another. The example is F, and I'll demonstrate it quickly in just a moment. The second would be fraction 
action meter signatures, another example of a free rhythmic structure. You may or may not have run across these, but if you play long enough professionally, you will run across both of these elements. Uh, Elliot Carter, for instance, you'll run across uh, the examples of uh, metric modulation or uh, fraction meter signatures. Uh, I can't think of the name of a composer, but I've seen it uh, in, in a number of different compositions uh, that uh, it has occurred, and it's occurred in these both, both of these forms, four and a half, four time, or four 0.54 time. I'll demonstrate the fraction meter signature first because it's easier. It would be like this. That's example G. 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and and 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and and 1. So it's just adding that little crazy little eighth note to the end. Now, Example F is a very interesting compositional technique. It'll be my grand finale of the whole uh, clinic presentation, but I want to do the first three measures of it so you see the radical difference in tempo as to how it affects the movement of the measures. <clears throat> if you'll listen to the first three measures, and I'll do it in the traditional way without metric modulation, it would sound like this. One olet, two olet, three olet, one olet, two olet, three olet, one and, two D and, one and, two. So I kept the quarter note pulse the best I could without a metronome constant. Now, in this case, I'm going to use metric modulation. I'm going to make the speed of the three eighth note triplets, just like our exercise here, of the second measure, the speed of the eighth notes, or the pace of the eighth notes of the third measure. So I'm going to destroy all feeling of pulse, but I'm still going to have a means of communicating, communicating a tempo change. That would sound like this. One olet, two olet, three olet, one olet, two olet, three olet, one and two d and one and two. You see what a radical difference of pace that made on the third measure using metric modulation. Rhythmic patterns have to be practical in notation. Remember, if you experiment as a composer with the mass, or in parentheses, mess, of mathematical possibilities in notation that aren't particularly rhythmically or musically effective, it doesn't matter how fascinating it might be to the eye or to, to be on paper if it isn't practical, again, to the performer. When he's trying to produce that, it is, again, a waste of valuable writing and performing time. Write your rhythms so that your performer can read and understand your rhythms. Communicate to your performer. Don't get caught up in the math because it looks good on paper, because somebody out there is going to have to interpret what you are writing to be able to play it as you want it to sound. Okay. Now, pace. Pace in music, this is the next big leg of your big understanding of understanding the elements. Pace in music is the speed at which the pulses of a measure of time occur. Not too complicated. It just means it's the speed at which the denominator of the meter signature occurs. So pace is often affected by the meter signature. And it is a subtle thing. But look at your example H. If I have a meter signature that goes one, two, three, four, or I have a meter signature that goes one, two, one, two, there's a very subtle influence that maybe the one, two is a little bit different pace or speed than the four, four was. It's a subtle one, but it's there. Then look at your example I. If I take a rhythmic pattern for pace and I put in it rhythmic patterns that go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, but at that same speed I go two, three, four, one D into two, and three D into four, and one D into two, and three D into four, and I've kept the pace exactly the same, but I've played a much faster rhythmic pattern, so there's a subtle illusion there that maybe the pace has really changed, but it hasn't, the rhythmic pattern has changed. So you see, meter signatures and rhythmic patterns have an uh, illusionary effect on the pace, and you need to be aware of that. So how do you think about pace? Think about it as a straight line. Don't think about it this way, rushing. Don't think about it that way as dragging. Think about your pace as a straight line. Think about good performance is going like this. 
the give and take of good performing around a straight line pace, like the metronome click. That give and take has to be there. Now, pace change is very important. Sometimes pace change is noticed more at a slow pace. If you make a change of tempo, for instance, you decide to go from 40 to 48, that's going to be noticed a lot more than if you decided to go from 180 to 188. So you have to be a lot more aware as a conductor if you're making pace changes at slow tempos and adjustments than you would be at a fast tempo. Also, a lot of rhythmic patterns and a lot of pieces have an optimal feel, and that happened to us as conductors. Old conductors, new conductors. You know, young conductors, old conductors. Young conductors, they take the music too fast. Old conductors, they take the music too slow. Maybe you should just have a 43-year-old conductor, I don't know. But the idea is there's an optimal range for the speed that a piece of music should go, and you can feel it. You can tell when you're starting to get outside of that optimal range. You need to be aware of that. So pace can be measured by some of the following. Your own ability, your ability to take a tempo. If somebody gives you a count off, I've seen it happen over and over, they don't take the count off. They don't take the speed that you were given, the pace you were given. You must be able to take the count off you must be able to follow a conductor. Pace is affected by someone rushing, by someone else dragging, by someone not being able to hold the tempo constantly. So what are some of the problems that bring that about? Well, it might be mind and motor control problems. It's obviously what I said before, not watching, not thinking. You might be scared or nervous. It could be a lack of technical coordination. You might drag when you're soft. You might rush when you're loud. You might tend to follow your section mate. You know, that happens in the violin sometimes. They tend to sometimes follow the person next to them maybe a little bit and then individual visualizing the, 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 the total effort. Sorry, I've got a violin player here. But uh, it's been a common problem that was talked about from, in the symphony from time to time. You might be following somebody else. You might not be counting individually with the music. You might not be paying attention. It might be a lack of concepts. It might be the acoustical characteristics of my instrument, sir. However, it could be, if all else fails, a bad conductor. So don't forget that one. All right. Accents. Accents are the final element of rhythm that emphasizes a pulse or a rhythmic pattern and helps it to become more prominent. Look at your example J. I take a little rhythmic pattern here and it's kind of nondescript. It goes like this. All right, let's change the feel of that a little bit. Let's make it four, four time. One and two and three, four and one and two and three, four, one and two, three, four. Let's make it three, four time. One and two and three, one and two and three and one, two, three and one, two, three. How about four, four with a pickup? Four and one and two, three and four and one and two, three, four and one, two, three, three, four with a pickup. Three and one and two, three and one and two and three, one, two and three, one, two. How about changing meter signatures? One and two and three, one and two and one and two, three, four and one, two, three. That almost takes on a personality there, doesn't it? Now, what caused that to change? What caused that to change each time so radically? If you're following the outline, look at the next step after L. And it is the bar line, right. Now, what happens if I take our post-season common sound song and I shift that bar line a little bit? <clears throat> then I come up with something like, me out to the ball game, take me out to the crowd by, me some peanuts and cracker jacks, I don't care if I never get back for its root root for the home team if they don't win, it's a shame for it's one, two, three strikes, you're out at the old ball game. Take <laughs> the bar line. Listen to the bar line. Listen to Bell's Law, the bar line. We're almost at the end of this section. What caused the subjective sound to change as each pattern was performed? the addition of the bar line. The bar line presents us with assets of security, of discipline, a rallying point, 
and a general feeling of organization that provides the much needed regimentation, especially with a group performance. However, if we allow the assets of the bar line to become pedantic, overmeasured, truncated, overcontrolled, stiffly precise, and predictable to the point of causing the music to lose its fluidness and its buoyance, then the bar line becomes a liability. When a musician understands meter, rhythmic patterns, and bar lines so firmly that he's able to appreciate and use these aspects of the music and yet is also able to subordinate the mechanics of using meter, patterns, and bar lines to the service of the overall linear, melodic, and harmonic qualities of the music, then true aesthetic possibilities can become a reality. And there you are, Bell's Law of the Bar Line. There are nine basic kinds of accent. I hope you knew that. You're about to. This is in. This will be the end of this section, so pay attention for just a few seconds more, please. First, a dynamic accent, that which you're most familiar with. A dynamic accent is an accent of tone intensity. Sforzando, accent, hit it harder. There is an agogic accent. An agogic accent is playing a tone longer than the tones that precede or follow it. Dum, ba, dum. So that's an accent of length. There's a metric accent. That's where we might play a pattern that's, say, the same as the meter signature. Bum, 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 bum. So we have a rhythmic pattern that occurs at the same pace as the pulse, a metric accent. There's a harmonic accent. A harmonic accent is produced by a dissonance that occurs on a pulse to be stressed. There is a weight accent. A weight accent is an addition of sound to the musical texture. That's where you just simply add more volume, more instruments, more voices. There's a pitch accent. That's an accent that's created at the highest or the lowest level in a series of tones. And the greater the distance, the greater the effect. There is a patterned accent. That is an accent that it occurs at a point where a series of notes repeat themselves in an exact or similar motion. You've heard that kind of sound before. There are embellished accents. Those are accents that are created by an embellishment of the melodic line. We know those as appoggiaturas, accacciaturas, mordants, turns, trills, upper lower nasal. The appoggiatura would be that anticipation of the pulse before it. Ta-da! Post 1800s ahead of the pulse. Uh, you can look those up and get some very exact definitions, but I've got some intricate definitions here, and it gets a little long for the presentation. And there is a tone color accent. A tone color accent, I think, is an interesting one because it's sort of an unexpected moment. It would be ding, a triangle stroke in the middle of a string passage. That's a tone color accent, a notable color change from surrounding sounds such as, as I noted, a triangle stroke in a string passage. Now, we've laid the backing of the puzzle down on the paper. We've got a few more pieces to put in place, but the backing is there. You have the elements of rhythm you should have an understanding of how it functions, how it works. What I haven't given you yet that we'll do after a short break is the actual mechanical necessity of the mathematical relationship between the rhythmic patterns and how you apply them, the real meat of the application of how you make it work. And that'll be the forthcoming section, Learning Rhythmic Patterns, our final section to this presentation.